in the this is the back book and in that I proved to my conviction that everything to do with one dimensional homotopy was better expressed in terms of groupoids rather than groups because you've got simpler theorems with more powerful proofs which I thought was quite a good thing but as one of the, re the re reviewers said about it in 1968 or so in the American Mathematical Monthly this reads like a book on topology written by a category theorist which <laughs> was actually quite perceptive and showed my real inclinations <laughs> um, uh, but it was not at that time meant as a, meant as a compliment <laughs> but you know, used universal properties but let me just since I'm here let me just do, do this trick right? so we'll go back to This is quite fun, let me just do it. So we go and put it as x, y, x, y, x, y to the minus 1, x to the minus 1, y to the minus 1, x to the minus 1, y to the minus 1. So if I had done it right, if you were children, I would get one of you to come out and do it for me. <laughs> 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 right? Would you like to do it? But you notice that this relation was deduced from all the other relations. So to get it off, you have to go through all the other relations. So you should start trying to push this over down to the bottom. Can you do that? Try, 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 try roughly, just randomly, try to push it over to the bottom this side as well. Almost there. Almost there. Right, carry on. Am I allowed to pull the knot? Yes, of course, yeah. yeah. Right, right. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Okay. Um, now, the notion of groupoid first arose in number theory generalizing the work of Gauss from binary quadratic forms to quaternary quadratic forms. And it wasn't just from sort of pure formality that was actually to express the idea of my brain. And they obviously early arose in the composition of paths, giving the geography to the intermediate steps. Groupoids have a partial multiplication, and this opens the door into the world of partial algebraic structures. So, According to my definition, high dimensional algebra is algebra structures with partial operations defined under geometric conditions. So that includes a wide variety of things. And I think it allows new combinations of algebra and geometry, new kinds of mathematical structures, and new ways of describing their interrelations. So if you do the previous proof and run it through, you're going to G is a set with two groupoid compositions, satisfying the interchange in your I, a double groupoid, then G contains a family of Arbelian groups. But double groupoids are more than Arbelian than groups, and n fold groupoids are even more non Arbelian. Um, and there are masses of algebraic and geometric examples uh, linking the classical themes, particularly cross modules and they have a rich algebraic structure. Now I should say my whole approach to this is to think in terms of higher dimensional group theory rather than higher dimensional category theory. Because I think those two so uh, there's two so different kinds of ideas as to what kind of thing they should do. So my idea was that um, in the nineteen sixties was that you should try and look for these things but all done in the spirit of group theory, partly because 
I thought groups were easier than monoids, and groupoids are easier than categories, from, from my point of view. So the pay, I wrote a paper on <laughs> vibrations of groupoids, but it was easier, I thought, to understand than vibrations of categories. So are there applications in geometry, in physics, in neuroscience? Quelo is that any simply defined and intuitive mathematical structure is bound to have useful applications eventually. If you search on the internet for higher dimensional algebra, currently there are 51,000 hits recently. Um, although, curiously, I think they've changed the whole way they do things because about a year or so ago, it got about 350,000 hits. <laughs> I don't know how to explain that. How, how did I get into this area? It was basically, as I said, the fundamental group of the, of the space with base points and the Lankampen theorem. To calculate the fundamental group of the union by saying the fundamental group is of the union is given by a push out. If, um, now I think in this audience, push out is clear for you, everybody knows what a push out is, is that right? Yeah, right. Um, but the point is the algebra models exactly the way you put the spaces together by u intersection v, u v or the u intersection v, that gives you. Union the, then that does the same thing for groups. You get a push out. The only problem about this is okay, but U and V are open, and U intersection V is path connected. So the one thing it doesn't do, if you take two steps like that, so that's their intersection. And if you don't, if you're choosing a base point, you don't know where to choose the base point. So if you don't know where to change the base point, the natural thing to do is to hedge your bets and choose a base point there and also a base point there. So you have two base points and then you're naturally thinking in terms of group points. So it does not calculate the fundamental group of the circle, and I was a bit mad at this, because I really want to do it in a uniform way. Um, so then we look at the fundamental group on a set of base points, and then you get exactly the same theorem for groupoids on a set of base points, where that means the set of paths in U union B joining points of A, and the homotopy paths of So to use this, just as the fundamental group is related to combinatorial and computational group theory, you need to do combinatorial and computational group theory. Um, but the surprising thing to me about this result is that actually in the end you may want to calculate the fundamental group of the union. And to do that you've actually calculated something bigger, namely this. And the thing you want sits inside this. And whereas this is a nice, simple geometric the topological theorem, if the union is very <coughs> complicated, which I think... Yeah, well, let me say this. This is a quotation from Rotundi. People are accustomed to work with fundamental groups and generators in relation to these and stick to it even in context when this is wholly inadequate, namely when you get a clear description by generators of relations only when working simultaneously with a whole bunch of base points chosen with care, or equivalently working in the algebraic context of group points rather than groups. Choosing paths for connecting the base points natural to the situation to one among them, and reducing the group point to a single group will then hopelessly destroy the structure and inner symmetries of the situation and result in a mess of generators in relation no one dares to write down because everybody feels they won't be of any use whatsoever and does confuse the picture rather than clarify it. I have known, he says, such perplexity myself for a long time ago, namely Van Kampen type situations, whose only understandable formulation is in terms of amalgamated sums or groupoids. So I couldn't agree more. 
with it than with that statement. Although, curiously, um, no textbook in algebraic topology um, so far has actually followed this path. Although my book was written in 19, published in 1968. So that's the kind of situation you might have. Or even more, you might get hundreds of components. And those situations actually occur in combinatorial group theory. Um, and the thing is, you do want the fundamental group at this point, maybe, but then you have to start choosing trees. But it seemed to me, against all the principles of homological algebra, that you should be able to compute something, not only even in a, and especially a non-abelian object, where the information you're given is in related in dimensions 1 and 0. You should get an exact sequence from which you can't determine everything explicitly. So what I was then looking for was higher dimensional versions of this, which in terms of the pictures we've had before, meant we're looking for higher dimensional group Standard structure, I don't know how many people here are committed, but for the second relative homotopy groups, space X, the subspace A, and the base point. So you consider homotopy cards of maps of a square root to X, which map these three sides to X and one edge to the base, to the subset A. The definition involves the thick lines show constant parts, so these are. These are constant. The definition involves choice and is unsymmetrical, which is unesthetic. And all compositions on the line, which doesn't accord with our picture of what we were trying to do. So now I want to talk about the definition which Philip and I made in 1967 before. We take homotopy classes of our vertices, the maps of the square into A, X all the edges into A and the vertices to a base point or maybe there's one base point or a set of base points and the childish idea you glue two squares together if the right hand side of one is the same as the left hand side of the other so that's a geometric condition now there is a horizontal condition, composition so when you say you can move this class to the class of this to the class of that, that means there's a homotopy H in A from this H to that H. But that choice is completely arbitrary. So how do you know? You have to show that this is well defined. But what you do is you look at a square uh, uh, figure like this. So here you've got alpha H beta, you've got alpha dash H dash beta. You've got a homotopy there from this one to this one, a homotopy there from this one to this one, but you've got this dirty gray hole in the middle. So what does that do about that? Well, the fact is that these squares, these edges, are all constant because you've taken real vertices. So you can fill the bottom one in with um, a constant um, square, and then you can retract from the top uh, to fill that in, and because these faces all map into A, this top face will be mapped into A, and so you do get um, a well-defined homotopy. Then you find that rho XAC has a dimension to the composition of the direction 1 and 2, satisfying the interchange law, and is a double group point, containing a substructure, which is the original relative homotopy groups, and the original fundamental group point. But we need to go a bit further. So this is the next part of my talk, which will be the last quarter of an hour. In dimension one, we still need the two-dimensional notion of commutative square. So a commutative square, most people, I'm sure everybody in the audience can do that. This was so easy when we first did it, I laughed so much I fell out of my cradle kind of a, B is equal to C, D. Um, 
an easy result is that any composition of commutative squares is commutable. And the commutative squares in a category form a double category. That's really, really easy and very old. And I think was first observed by Charles Ellison. Um, and these facts are part of the proof of the Van Kempen theorem in dimension one. So, and this is sort of both global stokes and local stokes. The question is, what is a commutative cube? And here, we don't want to say just the edges commute, but the face is actually commute. So, the interesting thing, we might say that the top face is the composite of the other faces. So, you fold the other faces flat, to give that picture. Um, and the trouble is, you can't form the composition of these five faces. So what does one do about that? Um, well what you do is you need fillers. You need ways of filling in these corners, because when you fold this flat, this edge is the same as that edge. And there should be a canonical way of filling in these. I'm now talking about the relations among these. So, we need special kind of squares called thin squares. So the easy squares are the identities in both directions. And they have the rules that they satisfy, they have no identities. But now we need some new ones which have edges like these. And these we call connections because I saw them appearing in a paper on differential geometry. So we write them generically like that. Now we need to say what are the laws on connections? Well, I write them like that and then I'll say in one dimensional algebra you can stand still walk forward, you can turn around and you can walk back. In two-dimensional algebra, not only can you do that, but you can also turn left and right. So this rule basically says that if you turn left and then right, then you're facing the same way. And this rule says that if you turn right and then left, you're facing the same way. This rule says that if you turn right with your arm outstretched, it's the same as turning right. And this rule says that turning left with your arm outstretched is the same as turning left. And so these rules are a part of two-dimensional algebra. And the term transport law for that one and the term connection came from laws on path connections in differential geometry. And these um, rules are now being used again in differential geometry. Uh, in this cubical setting by um, 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 Fario Martins and, and Roger Pickin um, in doing cubical formulations of some of these ideas. So a good exercise is to prove that any composition of commutative cubes is commutative according to that de definition uh, that we've given already. One of the things I thought of when we were doing this was that the, to formulate the question of what is a commutative cube in a double, cap, double groupoid, you need actually to subdivide a square into nine little squares. But then I thought, well, what happens in higher dimensions? Well, you then need to subdivide a cube into 27 little cubes. And you begin to see that the question of formulating ideas similar to these in higher dimensions begins to get a bit hairy. Um, but I'm pleased to say that with the help of Philip Higgins, all these problems are solved. And I'm not going to say anything in detail about the high-dimensional ideas, but um, 
a new book is coming out this autumn, and there are flyers on this, so I'm advertising this, which you're welcome to pick up, um, which give, and the flyers about the reprint of this book here as well, which you're welcome to pick up, because I published that myself in order to get it cheaply, available, cheaply available. So um, anything you do will be help, not help publishers, but will help me. Right? <laughs> but the new book is being published by the EMS and hopes to be out in the autumn, but possibly by the end of the year. And that's um, 650 pages. But we have tried to make it as intuitive as possible. So the first part of the book is all about dimensions one and two to explain the intuition. So, because you can't really see why you should expect the higher dimensional thing to work um, unless you actually follow through the two dimensional ideas, which are what I was explaining here. Um, and the, it is a totally new approach to algebraic topology. In algebraic topology, First thing you tend to do is singular homology or simplicial homology, and um, uh, you need simplicial approximation, all sorts of quite unpleasant ways of dealing with simplices. And in fact, one of the basic problems about simplices is this algebraic inverse to subdivision. Cubically, as you've seen from the pictures, it's pretty obvious how to define an algebraic inverse to subdivision. But when you cut up a simplex into little simplices, what do you mean by combining the simplices again so that you get the big simplex? And it, well, Richard Steiner claimed he'd actually done it at the last uh, you know, conference, but it was rather complicated. Whereas the case for cubically is quite simple. And in fact, very curiously, um, whereas a lot of people talk about higher categories in terms of Kahn complexes or simplicial, simplicial sets satisfying Kahn conditions, um, there are very many convenient structures on the singular cubical complex of the space, just map all cubes in, particularly involved with multiple compositions, but the general operatic approach to um, globular multiple categories has not been looked at cubically and which should, I think, be simpler in terms of multiple compositions. But what I'd like to finish with in this talk is just to show what this whole thing about two-dimensional rewriting. So we consider the notion of rotations um, in a double category with these thin elements. You can define a, a rotation that way by sticking on these connections like that, and you can define a, uh, a rotation the other way by sticking them on like that. And you can then prove that sigma u v is equal to sigma one over interchanges rotation and sigma the other one. So but you have to rewrite these and you get a big picture like that which you have to rewrite. So this is this is there is one rotation um, up to there. You have to rewrite that. But I think what I'd like to do Let's see, if we start with U, and then we do a rotation this way, and now suppose we do a rotation the other way. So how does that go? Um, Really, we want to do that. But 
that can be subdivided into this. And this can be yes, so that's let's put a little block around there so that we remember that. So that's like that, and then we can put that up there. And now this we can put that picture. But now, when we look at this block, because this is a product of these, that can be rewritten as When you do that all the way round, you end up with and then this gets changed to that. And this gets changed to that. And then you end up by proving that sigma tor is equal to 1. And when I first did this, I thought that this is a sort of magic. Does one really believe that this works? But it's really a consequence of the interchange law. So the interchange law um, has all sorts of extraordinary consequences, and particularly when applied to this. And in fact, this is a two. This was two-dimensional rewriting. Um, and then Richard Steiner um, did for a paper which we wrote together. He did some three-dimensional and similar things, and in proving that. Um, Cubical omega rubroids omega categories with connections are equivalent to globular omega categories. But this is a paper by Alago, Brown, and Steiner. Alago was a student of mine. But um, a key point in this was that um, he did three-dimensional writing to prove a Bray-type relation. Which is probably analogous to various kinds of switching things one does in the model categories. So, uh, just, to, how we can, just to allow time for, for questions, um, the idea of high dimensional group theory allows one to compute certain homotopy two types. And the current idea in the homotopy theory, first of all, you compute group homotopy groups. And then, with luck, you may sometimes be able to compute two types. This says that sometimes in this situation, you can compute two types but you have problems in computing the homotopy groups. Just like in the one-dimensional case, you can compute this big fundamental group work on many base points, but you have to use some combinatorics to get at the fundamental group. Same thing goes in higher dimensions. So, you can also